for me, racing started pretty deep in my family. My, my father, as well as my mother, were both past racers. You often find people at a high, intense, emotional moment while you're on pit road. This is really hard. You're, put, you're putting me on the spot, aren't you? Yeah, I am putting you on the hot seat now. Um, I had issues being a girl, a young woman in the sport. When you do get an opportunity, seizing the opportunity and doing really well at it. I've never seen a sponsor not sponsor someone because they are a female. I mean, Margarita be so all the way, baby. There, there's so many things going on that I don't even know everything that's going on. Hello everyone, welcome back to Georgie Stripping the Dipping and I am your unusual, um, the most unusual host ever. This is Georgie, by the way, yes. So the moments of happiness we enjoy take us by surprise and today I came as your host to take you by surprise. See, I made you happy. <laughs> All right, so um, this is going to be a girl's night sort of episode because we have this amazing, amazing person today. Uh, she's a prominent racing driver and a NASCAR sports reporter. This is Jacqueline Drake, drum rolls. <laughs> How are you, Jacqueline? Hi. Oh, I love that intro. I'm doing good. Thank you so much for having me on. Oh, thank you so much for coming over. <laughs> um, so the first question we always ask is, where did your passion of motor race begin? So where did it start? What was the racing scene like when it came to go-karting and driving quarter midget cars? Uh, well, for me, racing started pretty deep in my family. My my father, as well as my mother, were both past racers. So I was only six weeks old, and I was taken to my first dirt track, and my dad was competing in a 305 sprint car. So um, I started at a pretty young age, just going out to the racetracks, supporting him, watching him, and my uh, dad, whenever I turned six years old, he got myself involved in competing. So I started doing dirt go-karts and then moving up through the ranks, um, the age ranges, through all the different divisions of that. And then eventually I moved over into asphalt quarter midgets, then asphalt legends, as well as doing uh, asphalt late models. And for the most part, all of that was in Texas, Kansas, Oklahoma, and a little bit in Colorado, which is, um, I'm originally from Texas, so we just kind of stayed in that region. And I competed and raced for 13 years before I moved on into working in the sport. So yeah, for me, it started at, at a very young age. So that's actually a shout out for Dr. Oobs and Blake as well, because both of them are from um, Texas as well. So there you go. So many people from Texas. So many, so many talents. <laughs> yes, I, I love it. Texas is, um, you know, people always say everything's bigger and better in Texas. And as a Texan myself, I, I have to agree. It's a great place to, to experience. And I actually grew up on a farm in Texas. So uh, it was it was a great, great time for me. Okay, this is like a, a detour from the whole podcast questions that I have for you. Tell me about your farm. <laughs> Tell me about that life. Well, um, it was about 70 acres and we had three sets of my grandparents that lived out on the farm. So as well as me and my family, and we had all sorts of animals, cows, horses, ducks, peacocks, goats, buffalo. We had two ponds. And I, I could go on and on about animal stories. We really had so much happening. My grandpa also had a chicken coop. So we had fresh eggs all the time. And it, it was quite the experience. That's like a wonderful childhood memory. Wow. That's like, oh my God, that's so, so, dude, that's like super cool. <laughs> that's yeah, amazing. I'm. I really did love it. The only, I guess, like small downside is in my school, everybody that was involved in FFA. So like future farmers of America. So they showed animals and I was involved in racing. So, um, I was like a little bit of an outcast going to mm -hmm. school at 
small town just because I was really into motorsports as well as my brother. But um, yeah, it was it was a small town and I really loved growing up there. And, you know, in a small town, you have so many uh, neighbors that are like family. And I went to school there the whole time, kindergarten through my senior year. So I knew everybody's parents and grandparents. And it was just a really fun and nice environment to be around versus like a big city. All right. So you said that you were the person who was going for racing while the other others were like involved in the farming part. So you studied marketing at university and moved to North Carolina. What inspired the move? How did you adapt? And what was it like working as a graphic designer at Roche F's Engines? Oh, man, I will tell you what that journey from the move from Texas to North Carolina is oftentimes described as the dark years in my mind, because when um, I made that jump, I was newly 21. I had, again, been around my family all the time through racing. And, um, you know, even as a young adult, I was with them often and, you know, fresh out of college. Um, I had some marketing experience, but really not anything that where your resume should be, especially to get hired uh, inside of motorsports. So when I moved to North Carolina, I was real. I was really, really green. I was a. I did not know which way I should go about trying to get a job, and I was here for a few months. I couldn't really get a, a team to pay attention to my resume. I I'd, I'd go in. I'd give them my resume and they throw it away or they would laugh at it and like, okay, yeah, we'll put it in the pile of the other hundreds that we get every day. Oh my gosh. Um, and so uh, funny enough, I actually ran into someone just, I, I met this guy who um, I got to know and we were crossing paths just at this, this storage building. And he asked me where I was from and asked me kind of what I was doing. And at the time I was working at David's bridal just to make some money. And mm -hmm. um, he said, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I'm really trying to work in racing, but I haven't really had anyone that can help me or kind of open that door to get my resume in. And he goes, Oh, well, um, I work at Roush Yates and they're hiring someone in the marketing department and I could give them your resume. And I was, floored because I hadn't had anyone offer to do that or I didn't have anyone to kind of get my resume in the right hands to at least be considered. So I went in a couple of days later and I interviewed there and they told me, they said, this is your shot. We're going to give it to you. You're going to work with the big dogs now. And I will tell you what, as a graphic designer, which was what I was hired as, I was terrible. I didn't, I, they definitely took a chance on me and I grew so much in the three years that I was there or almost four years that I was there, but um, they took a big leap of faith hiring me because I look back on my resume and I'm like, well, no wonder I wasn't hired because I really didn't have good credentials at, at that point in time. Oh my gosh. Okay. So one of the reasons that I had to come and host this whole amazing episode was um, both of, apparently both of the guys uh, who are usually hosting are stuck at work. So I have to, you know, <laughs> jump in and made it a whole girls episode. So I hope that our listeners are enjoying as well as Jacqueline does. So, um, so my third question, well, randomly, I just, I just started saying that because <laughs> just now um, from Black was telling me that he's also stuck at work. So I had to give that uh, excuse as well. So I hope that you enjoy this episode with this amazing lady that we have here. The third question that I'm going to ask you is, in the role you do as a reporter, how important is connecting the fans to the sport? How, um, could you give our listeners a funny story in relation to the cars tour and Petro TV interviewing you did with the drivers? I mean, you might be having tons of... Um, funny situations and moments that you have uh, gone through and experienced as well. You're absolutely right. There are lots of experiences that happen on pit road. You you often find people at a high intense emotional moment while you're on pit road because typically the things good, the things bad 
all happen on pit road. So if, if someone wrecks, you see the reactions of the team, you see the reactions of the driver. If someone is winning, you see those same reactions just on the opposite end of the scale. So um, as a reporter, which I've been now doing pit road reporting for seven years, and we have seen those things take place it's so important to portray that to the audience who isn't there. As a past driver, I have felt like I'm able to comprehend challenges that a team may be having without even asking them. I can look at the car. I can understand what's happening. I can talk to a team member and they feel safe in, in me reporting it the right way and not maybe you know, saying something that is inaccurate. And then I also have compassion for the driver in a moment uh, that they may be heated, that they may not say something that they're going to be proud of later, just giving them a moment, getting that water and then saying, all right, now it's time to interview them. So, um, you know, I, uh, I have a lot of funny moments. Um, I have a lot of weird moments. I, there's been a time where th during a race, they have the fuel cans and I've had someone throw like turn around and just throw one back without actually setting it down into the holder. And it like completely knocked me over. <laughs> I didn't, Oh my God. <laughs> I didn't even see, I thought that they would just set it back down. They didn't, they just like threw it back. Didn't even look. It knocked me, knocked me back. Um, I've had funny stories of drivers, you know, they, they, uh, don't necessarily want to get interviewed, but I may have to entice them and be like, Hey, I'll buy you a candy bar after this. Just come, come do a quick update or, um, and the cars tour. We, we also did many games up in the stand, grandstands with fans. And I remember one time we did a game and it was kind of like a crab walk where you had to put your hands on the ground and it was hot asphalt. So all the drivers were like, this is terrible. We've been roped into the worst thing of our <laughs> lives. <laughs> um, so there's lots of moments with, you know, with the fans or the drivers and the teams at that and that I really enjoy and getting to be up close and personal to experience, you know, these highs and lows of someone's life. It, I feel very fortunate to see. So it feels like the 2022 NASCAR series just concluded, but what storylines and rivalries are you looking forward to the most this season for 2023? Oh, my. You know, last year we had a really good year. There was so many different things that kind of closed out on the 22 season. And, of course, we just kicked off with the clash at L.A. out in the Coliseum. And that produced lots of storylines. Of course, you're on this really tight bull ring atmosphere and everyone's hitting each other i mean most recently joey logano and kyle bush now they're feuding against each other and i also am interested to see how the gibbs versus gragson feud continues to develop since it was something that had come to head towards the end of 2022 so there's lots of feuds there's so much to see daytona right around the corner and then of course, from there, we'll go to Auto Club in Las Vegas. So um, I, I'm really excited for this year. We're going to go to um, Chicago. We're going to do a street course race. And we're going to be back at Bristol with dirt. So they're trying a lot of new things at NASCAR. And I love to, I love to be a part of it. And, you know, I'm a race fan at heart. So I'm, I'm always excited to just see how it all pans out. All right. So let me ask you a fun question then. Um, Let's get the NASCAR drivers into this question. So we basically ask this question from every guest who appears on our podcast. Um, this edition is called Taxi, Dinner and Avoid. So you'll be choosing one of the few drivers from uh, NASCAR edition to drive you as the taxi driver. And there will be a dinner. So you will be having dinner with one of the NASCAR drivers. And there you need to choose one of the NASCAR drivers to avoid at all costs. So <laughs> whom you will be choosing? <laughs> and oh, why, do you, why do you want to avoid that person as well? I mean, we need to say something. <laughs> oh, my goodness. This is really hard. You're, put, you're putting me on the spot, aren't you? Yeah, I am putting you on the hot seat now. <laughs> Um, does it have to be a NASCAR cup driver? 
Oh, it doesn't have to be. Uh, as someone related to Nazca, it's okay. <laughs> That's going to be a card for you. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay. Someone that has to be my taxi and someone that has, someone I have dinner with and someone that I avoid. Yep. Okay. Okay. All right. Let me think about this. Okay. Someone to drive my taxi. I'm going to go with Joey Logano. I feel like, mm -hmm. I feel like he would be a good taxi driver. Like he has glasses. Like I could just see that kind of vibing with him. I could see him wearing, you know, one of those like old school taxi hats. Like I feel safe with Joey being the driver. <laughs> um, uh, the dinner, um, I don't know. This is hard. This is really hard. Um, okay, because they're all they're all men, so this can't be taken romantically. <laughs> uh, don't worry, we won't be. <laughs> um, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say Martin Martin Trucks Jr. I think he's a great guy. My brother Ooh. used to or my brother used to work for him. I was a fan of his whenever I was younger. So. I, I'm going to say him. I think that's a safe bet. Um, and then... You, you chose the safest thing that ever... You know, I like the fan love. You chose all of that. <laughs> okay. That's the safe choice. Okay. Who's the yeah. avoid part? Um, I, I'm i going to avoid Kyle Bush. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm going to avoid him. I see. I did not give you... I didn't give you a lot there, but... Yeah, I'm just, I'm going to say, I feel like everyone I picked is very safe. So I'm going to go the safe route here. Yeah, you've been choosing all the safe choices. <laughs> all right, well, speaking I, of safety. I don't want to up, I don't want to kick up any dirt, so. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so uh, speaking of safety, women in sports, what's your honest assessment and perspective of women in motor sports at the moment? Do you believe we can be optimistic of seeing a Jamie Chadwick break ground into a series like F1 or even IndyCar? Now she's part of uh, the Androti Autosport program. Yes, I. So I'm a huge advocate for women in sports. Um, and the you know, let me kind of step back a second. Whenever I was racing, when mm -hmm. I was younger, when I was racing, I started when I was six. And it continued on until I, I stopped racing. So, which was when I was 19, I took a break. Um, I had issues being a girl, a young woman in the sport. I had a competitor or a crew member or something that would have, something would come up essentially almost every time I went racing. And as a six-year-old, as a, think of like your six-year-old six -year self or a six-year-old girl, a, a a group of drivers telling you that what you're doing isn't right or you shouldn't be doing it. We have come leaps and bounds in motorsports from that point of my life. We have we see women um, that are engineers. We see women that are on air. We see women that are drivers in the upper series of motorsports that are competing. We see women that are pit crew. We see them as PR. We see them in all aspects of these sports that are typically male dominated. And I absolutely, we've already seen Danica do it at the Cup Series level, but I absolutely will see women continue to come up through the NASCAR program. We have some already that are moving up through the developmental programs. You have Haley Deegan that's kind of, you know, spearheading that currently, but I'm excited to see it only become more. I love seeing the programs like you mentioned F1 and what they're doing in IndyCar. And I love to see that. And, you know, now there's women in motorsports groups that you can go and be a part of and feel like people can kind of help you through and coach you through some challenges that do still exist. But absolutely, we have come so far in women in motorsports. And I am a huge supporter of that. But do you think that there will be a chance for all uh, for a team like um, all women teams or like um, more women seats, more women drivers in F1 series or whatever the series that more male dominant series? Do you think there will be a fair chance for all these girls? Because there are so many young girls with like great talents depth of talents but sometimes they are not having the chance to actually prove that because no one is there to take a chance on them 
So do you think that that will be uh, eventually be changing just like it has changed? I mean, we have come a long way um, looking at looking behind, looking back. Um, and if you're looking at the current situation. So do you think that this will take a leap and will change uh, in the better future as well? I think so. And, you know, I can't speak on F1 or Indy car on, you know, where that's going to go. But I know from an asphalt, asphalt racing standpoint, you know, in the upper series of asphalt racing, it comes down to getting the sponsorship to support you in, in where you want to go. Women definitely, if they just get more eyes on them, there's not as many women. So they do get more eyes and they do get critiqued, but it's really important. And I think in just really all aspects of life that when you do get an opportunity, seizing the opportunity and doing really well at it. And I think that's where the pendulum kind of swings, right? that and it's it's no different than a male driver getting the opportunity and doing a really good job at it if a woman comes through and that's what happens then that leads into more opportunities leads into more sponsorship leads in into moving your career further up um i do see that happening there's a few uh women right now that are in those developmental series even in dirt racing usac or power eye that are that are doing just that they're getting the opportunities they're seizing it they're doing well and then that's when they get more sponsorship they get more support so um you know i think it's two sides it's one getting the sponsorship support and then two backing that up with with good results yeah but do you do you believe that there's always has been a difference when it comes to sponsorships between uh, male drivers and female drivers? Do I think it's been different, like approached differently? Yeah. No, I mean, I think that there has been maybe more male drivers that have more successes. So they are maybe supported first. Um, mm -hmm. But there hasn't been necessarily a lot of female drivers in the mix. There hasn't mm -hmm. been like that fair 50-50 of here's half men, here's half women. Who's, you know, who has or who's the money going to go to? Mm -hmm. um, I think that as a sponsor, there's, you know, there's many companies that look to sponsor a woman in racing that they can get behind and they can support because as a female in a male dominated industry, you're again, naturally going to have more eyes on you. So yeah. I don't, I've never seen a sponsor, not sponsor someone because they are a female. Okay. So um, speaking of females, you also have a podcast yourself called Sealed Up focused on asphalt late model racing and building the fan base for short track racing. What was the inspiration for this idea and how have you used your marketing abilities to promote the podcast to different audiences? Yeah, we had that podcast. Um, Hannah Newhouse and I had that podcast with Motor Racing Network. Um, let's see, for, 2000, for two years, we had it for 2019 and 2020. And then in we stopped doing that after COVID, but um, it was about asphalt short track racing. We saw a need for late models, particularly that wasn't necessarily covering the behind the scenes stories or again, the things that we see at the track as a reporter. So we did that and um, we supported that through digital efforts. And we had on many different guests throughout the course of that time that were also in the industry. And a lot of our listeners actually came from the West Coast because they didn't, they couldn't find, you know, the in, the intel on some of the short track storylines. So they would listen to our podcast. So we really, we really love doing that. And, um, you know, you never know, maybe we'll bring it back one day. I think you should bring it back. <laughs> I mean, there are so many people who are very interested in knowing all those details. So I think it's, it's high time <laughs> that you bring yeah. it back. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in 2021, you joined NASCA full time as manager in direct to consumer strategy. Um, how did this opportunity come to fruition and how have you found the experience so far? Well, 
that opportunity came about after a lot of emailing and a lot of uh, following up because I had been having meetings and essentially talking to NASCAR for almost two years before that job opening never really came about. Um, and they called me up one day and they said, we have this, we have this opening. We think that you'd be perfect for, and it's been a hybrid role. So it's been, you know, part of the media strategy, but also of course the pit pit reporting pieces that we've been talking about. Um, but it was, it was a dream come true and came in perfect God's timing on, on when the job came and the experience has really been nothing short of incredible. And I'm sure you know, people probably listening to this might roll their eyes like, oh, okay, incredible <laughs> like work. But it really has been. It's been a grind. I've been working in racing for 10 years now. This is my 11th season. And to get to this point where I finally am in a role where I can make a difference in motorsports and do what I love, I've been absolutely the happiest I could be uh, when it comes to working. <laughs> Well, um, I can't disagree on that because I'm sort of being very happy when I work as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, it is what it is, right? So yeah. let me ask you this question. Who is Jacqueline Drake without the titles? Mm. That sounds like something my boyfriend would ask me. Um, <laughs> he always tells me that I have this whole side of me that people don't get to see. Um, mm -hmm. I am very corny. I'm very, I like to joke around. I love to, I love to be outside. I love my dog. I am very spontaneous. And I mean that as in I'll book a flight in an hour and I'll leave to go wherever. I'll drive to New York City just to go see it. Um, I love my family more than anything breathing i will do anything for them i and i really i really just i love life i love god i and um i'm i feel like i'm a pretty happy person so <laughs> i don't know i don't know what you title all of that a conglomerate of uh something but yeah that's you know something i think that it's no different than everyone else in life we everyone sees one side of things just like social media you get to see one side of a person but there's a, there's also so much more to life so many struggles we go through so many highs that people get to experience and um yeah that that's just kind of me well i think jacqueline drake is a very happy soul <laughs> with a lot of positivity and optimism <laughs> so you know like hmm, always looking for that sunshine in every single thing so that's a very wonderful way of seeing life and that's amazing not Thank everyone you. has that perspective that's like wow <laughs> Thank you so much you're making me blush over here oh. <laughs> um okay so Next question. Mm -hmm. uh, we are almost running out of questions now because, I mean, looking at all the questions that I've been asking you, you have like a lot of things in your life that you have experienced um, from racing to marketing to being here and there and all this experience. So you're full of life. You have experienced life. So that's an amazing journey. Um, I'm pretty sure that you'll be having tons and tons of stories to tell um, in the near future as well. If someone is asking you about funny moments and all the all life experience that you have and the life lessons that you have gone through and all that. So um, the next question I'm going to ask you with all that experience, predict a date on a 500 winner. Oh. Yeah, you never expected that race, isn't it? <laughs> and you know, Speaking of unexpected, a Daytona 500 winner is truly unexpected because it really comes down to those last laps with the drafting and who can survive. Um, predicting a Daytona 500 winner, I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to go with someone a little bit, a little bit off the cuff. I'm going to mm -hmm. say, I'm going to say Ryan Priest. I think he's Ooh. an underdog. I think it's someone that people typically wouldn't pick, but I feel like if he's in the right place at the right time, I think he would be the guy to make the move to make it happen 
to get that 500 championship? I mean, Ryan, if you're listening to this podcast, um, see, she's already supporting you. So you better give, give her something when you win that. <laughs> yeah, Ryan, if you, if you win the 500, I'm going to be, you know, expected to get an invite to that celebration party. <laughs> Definitely worth the celebration, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it will be. All right. So the next question for you. Tips and advices for young girls breaking into motorsport as a person who is already in the motorsport and has been through a journey. Oh, man. You know, I get a lot of uh, young girls that message me and ask me this um, almost every day on Instagram or Facebook. And for the most part, I tell them, you know, number one is don't stop. If you know that you want to do this, then you keep going. You keep trying. You keep finding ways to make yourself better, to align yourself with the right people, and don't stop. If I would have stopped doing this when someone told me to stop, I would have stopped whenever I was a kid. If I would have stopped the first time I picked up a microphone, I would have never got to experience all the cool things that I have now, which grow you into a better person. So don't stop. Be persistent and be hardworking, which kind of aligns with that. But essentially, hard work is one thing that people cannot fake. People can say that they've done something, but they can't fake the hard work. And if you really commit yourself into being the best at what you want to do, you will become the best. It takes a lot of a lot of focus, but it's totally you're totally capable of doing that. Um, and then I think the, the third thing is just don't be so hard on yourself. Like there's a lot of times where you think that your journey, you should be somewhere and you're not, but again, God's timing, God's journey for you, it all happens in perfect timing. So just don't be so hard on yourself, work hard and don't stop working hard and it will, it'll all come together for you the way it's supposed to. It's like the song, Don't Stop Believing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you said don't stop, literally that song came into my mind and I was like playing it in my mind, like don't stop believing. And I'm like, oh my God, let me focus. <laughs> okay. I love that. Hold on to your feelings. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, in our podcast, we asked these um, two questions. The first one was um, that taxi dinner and avoid question. And the finale question that we always ask is this question. So it's more of a controversial question. So from Mario Andretti to Rafael Marcello to Matt Gallagher to every single person who um, featured on the podcast, we definitely ask and even Brian Herder. So mm, Jacqueline, are you ready? I, I think I'm ready. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let me breathe. <laughs> okay. Let's go. <laughs> um, Pineapple on pizza, yay or nay? No. <laughs> why? Why? <laughs> I don't like pineapple at all. Oh my gosh, why is that? Why do you hate pineapple? I don't know. I'm not a huge fan of the color yellow, and it's yellow. And it, it just smells so strong. I'm like, I don't want it on any of my food. I don't even want it by itself, so... <laughs> <laughs> so I'm pretty sure F1 Black right now became the biggest fan of yours for saying no pineapple on pizza. And I'm definitely, I'm definitely sure that Mario Andres is loving you right now for that. Oh. <laughs> well, you just tell Mario Andretti that we can be best friends if he wants. <laughs> I mean, Margarita pizza all the way, baby. <laughs> um, so, um, what, so, you are familiar with uh, all these racing. So in US, do you think there has been proper exposure for all these series, just like the exposure that F1 is getting for the rest of the world? Because as a person, so I basically live in Sri Lanka, Colombo, and the boys are in London. So as a person from Sri Lanka, for me, all these race series in US are actually um, very new for me. So I am getting to know all these uh, new series, even IndyCar, even uh, all these racing series in the U.S. are very, very not familiar for us. 
the only thing that you know, people in Sri Lanka knows is actually regarding the F1, unless uh, there are people who are like me who are very, very, very into racing cars. So do you mm-hmm. think that there's enough exposure for the US series uh, for the rest of the globe? Yeah, I think that on our side, when it comes to, you know, circle track asphalt racing, essentially, that there's so many different levels, there's so many different pillars of it from the nat that we have over 50 NASCAR sanctioned short tracks over <laughs> here. We have our own modified series. We have the ARCA division, which is separated into East and West as well as national. Then of course we have the trucks, we have NASCAR Xfinity and then NASCAR cup. And, you know, there's a whole other side to that with on NASCAR international broadcast that is advertised um, with the series. So there's a lot of exposure to um, the organization itself. And quite frankly, there there's so many things going on that I don't even know everything that's going on. Um, but they have done a lot of work in marketing both internationally and here in the U.S. Uh, for NASCAR itself. And they've also done you know, they've branched out into these docu-series, which we saw um, a little bit last year with Peacock. So um, I think they do a really great job, but there's there's always more to, to learn. So let me ask you the final question. Wait, have, have I been saying so many final questions? So, okay, this is the last question that I'm going to definitely ask you, all right? Okay. Um, so as the person who's in front of the camera and who has been behind the wheels, which would you choose as your theme? Do you like to get behind the wheels or do you like staying in front of the camera? Uh, I, I get asked this often, especially as a past driver. So mm-hmm. one of the reasons I fell in love with pit road reporting is because while I'm on pit road, I get an adrenaline rush similar to whenever I used to race. Um, if I have to choose, I choose to do the reporting I love still jumping behind the wheel and putting my helmet on and being a competitor, but I just see that as a hobby for me. Um, And the reporting is my career. So if I can find a passion in something that I used, I was a part of, and I used to love, and I get that same feeling like I do with reporting as I once did with something I was a part of, like, I think that's really special. So I, that's why I, I really do love being a reporter because I'm like, man, I feel like I have found my, my true calling here with getting to be a part of this sport. And yeah, I mean, it's fun to be a race car driver, but I, I feel like I've lucked out in finding this. You finally found your calling. Like you said, like, this is what I want to do. Like, finally you are where you want to be yeah and i actually got to race about a year ago i 10 years since the last time i raced i went back and i did a late model race and it was so much fun i i loved it i finished seventh so we did top 10 in 10 years that's what we called it but Mm -hmm. i had so much fun and i really did love it and i got out of there and i was like all right cool yeah this is like something that i'll do on the side but I'm not going to pursue it as a career because whenever I was younger and I was trying to pursue it as my career, it was very stressful. And it's just, it's so fun to get in the race car and then, and just have fun in the race car. I mean, um, at some point, I guess, because of all those stress that you've built up, you have that uh, triggered. But when it comes to that, I think mental health is also important for the for the media people and for the racers and every single person who is working under pressure as well, especially in the motorsport racing as well. Absolutely. It, it really is. And, you know, hats off to, and I, I mean this in all, all areas of national sports, athletes, both in racing or football or baseball, whatever you're in, on just being able to handle all the pressure that does come with that job because, um, you know, like I said earlier, we're all people, we all deal with stuff and they 
essentially have to pull it together for a game or for a race. And, um, you know, it, it's a lot of, a lot behind the scenes that people don't know about that you're dealing with as a professional athlete. All right. So this is um, Jacqueline Drake. So tell us your social handles so our listeners can actually follow you. And, you know, um, please do not stalk this lady because she, uh, she's actually an amazing person. So let her live her life. So but <laughs> please do keep in touch with what she's doing and let's support her. So tell us your social handles, Jacqueline. <laughs> You are so sweet. Well, I I love being on Instagram. You can find me there at the one and only JKD or just search Jacqueline Drake, which is Jack, J-A-C-K-L-Y-N. I'm on Facebook under my name as well. And I'm also on Twitter at the one and only JKD. So um, that handle is something I created the one and only off of a MySpace account like 20 years ago. So it's still holding true. And um, I would love to connect with anyone. And if there's any young journalists out there that want to um, ask for advice or anything, feel free to reach out. I really do check my DMs and um, I try to be that, um, you know, advocate for you and send the ladder back down because we all just have to help one another. Thank you so much for that. And thank you so much for joining us today as well. Do you have uh, anything uh, to say to your fans? (laughs) No, I I don't just, I I thank you so much for all the support for the people that have um, been there with me through all of it and continue to, and I can't wait for the next chapter, whatever that may be. Well, I'm pretty sure that it's going to be dashing and amazing, as wonderful as you are. <laughs> That's no doubt. <laughs> and I hope that you will be bringing that podcast back again, please, for the sake of well, us. <laughs> if I do, I'll send you a link. <laughs> yes, please. I would love that. I would love that. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us today, Jacqueline. I know that you are super busy. And with that schedule, you actually managed to come over and talk to us. So I really appreciate that uh, effort. And I am so sorry because uh, today the boys are missing. But here I am <laughs> entertaining you and my listeners as well. Um, so I hope that you actually had fun uh, joining us. And I hope that you will be joining us again someday, someday, someday in your future soon. Yes, if you ever need a guest, I will happily come back. And um, sorry to the boys, I'll maybe catch you next time. <laughs> <laughs> they would, they would definitely come over <laughs> because they would love to talk to you. <laughs> well, folks, that's it for today on Georgie stripping the dipping. Uh, that was Jacqueline Drake, and this is Georgie signing off. So I hope that you guys are having a wonderful, wonderful time. Um, I mean, over. Oh, I, I don't know whether you guys are listening to this on the weekends or the week, but however it is, I hope that you will be enjoying the whole time. So with much love.